People commit the gambler's fallacy when they believe, on the one hand, that the outcomes of a chance setup are genuinely random, and on the other hand, that the outcomes can be influenced by the history of previous outcomes. These are logically incompatible, they can't both be true. This isn't the only kind of irrationality you see in casinos, but as we've seen in the previous videos in this series, it's a window into some important concepts that we should all be familiar with if we want to avoid falling into behaviors that will hurt us in the long run. In this video, I want to use casino games as another window. We've talked about what a fair bet is, but here I want to unpack what that looks like in terms of the expected value of an act, and use this concept to ask some questions about how casinos make their money, what your chances really are of making money in a casino, and eventually to open up a broader discussion about the rationality of betting behavior. So what is the expected value of an act? To start, we need to distinguish an act, which is something you do, from the consequences of the act, which are all the possible outcomes of performing the act. And then we need to talk about the costs and benefits of each of the possible outcomes. These are values associated with each outcome. In economics and formal decision theory, these are called utilities. But all they are is a measure of how much we care about each of the different outcomes. So schematically, we have a picture that looks like this. We have an act represented by the letter A, and in this case we're assuming the act has only two possible outcomes, which we're calling C1 and C2. Each of these has a utility or value associated with it, which we can write as V as a function of C1 or C2. These could be anything. The act could be buy a lottery ticket, or bring an umbrella to the picnic, or open a small business, or ask my partner to marry me. The consequences could be I win the lottery or I don't. It rains on the picnic or it doesn't. She says yes or she says no. Each of these outcomes has a utility or value associated with it, usually positive or negative. If I win the lottery, that's a big positive. If I lose, that's a small negative. If I bring the umbrella and it rains, I don't get wet, which is positive. If I don't bring it and we get wet, that's negative. If she says yes, that's a big positive. If she says no, that's a big negative. There's one more concept we need to add. The different outcomes may not be equally likely. Sometimes we know that one outcome is more likely to happen than the other so we can ascribe a probability to each of the outcomes. Here we call them the probability of C1 and the probability of C2. Now we have enough to define the expected value of the act. The expected value of an act is just the sum of the values of each of the possible outcomes weighted by the probability of each outcome actually occurring. The expression on top expresses this relationship formally as a sum of products. Now formal decision theory requires that you assign numbers to each of these terms. When money is involved, this makes it easy to work with because dollars gained and dollars lost can stand as a useful proxy for the positive and negative values associated with different outcomes. So here's a decision problem that we can use to illustrate an expected value calculation. You visit Grandma the Gambler. Grandma likes to give gifts, but she always gives you a choice. Grandma says, here, you can take this dollar. It's a sure thing. I'll give you this dollar. Or you can roll this six-sided die. Now, if the dice rolls a one, you get $5. That's a nice payout. But if you roll a two, three, or four, you only get 50 cents. And if you roll a five or a six, you only get 10 cents. So here's your choice. Do you take the dollar or do you roll the dice? Well, if you take the dollar, that's a sure thing. If you roll the dice, you risk getting less than a dollar, but you also have a chance of getting more than a dollar. Now, when you actually confront people with a choice like this, what usually happens is that you discover whether a person is a risk taker or a risk avoider. People who are attracted by the potential for a bigger payout will opt to roll the dice. People who are more drawn to a sure thing will take the dollar. Almost no one performs a calculation in their head, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to work out what the expected value of that gamble actually is. First, we'll do the calculation, and then we'll talk about what it really means. All right, let's start with the expected value of taking the dollar. Well, this is easy. The only outcome we need to consider is getting the dollar, and the probability is one. So the expected value of taking the dollar is one times one dollar, which is one dollar. Now, what's the expected value of our gamble? It's the sum of the payouts for each of the possible outcomes weighted by the probability of each outcome. We have all this information. The first term is the probability of rolling a one times the value of rolling a one. The value is five dollars, and the probability is just one in six. The second term is the probability of rolling a 2, 3, or 4 times the value of rolling a 2, 3, or 4. The value is 50 cents, or 0.5 if we're using units of dollars. The probability is 3 out of 6. The final term is the probability of rolling a 5 or a 6 times the value of rolling a 5 or a 6. Well, the value is 10 cents, or 0.1 dollars. 
and the probability is 2 out of 6. So this expression gives you the expected value of this gamble. When you do the math, you get this. It's $1.11. So it turns out that the expected value of the gamble is more than the expected value of the sure thing. If we were using a rule that says to choose the act that maximizes the expected value of the act, then we should take the gamble. Now, at this point, a lot of people will scratch their head and wonder what it is that we've done here. After all, there's no scenario in which you actually get $1.11, so what's going on? The expected value doesn't represent what you will win on a single roll of the dice. The easiest way to interpret it is that it represents your average winnings if you were to roll the dice many times. Most of the time you'll only get 50 cents, sometimes you'll only get a dime, and more rarely you'll win $5. Your average winnings are the total winnings divided by the number of times you roll the dice. Another way to think of it is if you got to keep your winnings on each round and played for 100 rounds. One person always chooses to take the dollar, and another person always chooses the gamble. At the end of 100 rounds, the person who always chooses the dollar will have $100. But the person who chose the gamble can expect to have more than $100. The expected value would be $111. It's not guaranteed, but as the number of rounds increases, the likelihood of the earnings converging on these ratios increases so that after, say, 1,000 rounds, we can reliably predict that the person choosing the gamble is going to have something very close to $1,100. That's the sense in which the expected value of this gamble is higher than the expected value of simply taking the dollar. Now, the fact that you'll make more money in the long run taking the gamble doesn't tell us what we should do in the short run. It's an objective fact that the gamble has a higher expected value than taking the dollar. But to take the view that we should always choose the act that maximizes expected value is to adopt a very specific theory of rationality. A lot of ink has been spilled over the past 200 years on the question of whether we can turn expected value maximization into a general theory of rational choice. There are some serious objections to thinking that we can, but I won't get into those here. What I want to do now is use this concept of the expected value of a gamble to talk about casino games and how the payoffs are structured to ensure that the house always makes money in the long run. First, we need to revisit the concept of a fair bet or a fair gamble. With this concept of expected value, we can state it in a very clear way. A fair bet is one where the expected value of the bet is zero. Now, what does this mean? Well, we assume that a bet has the chance of winning or losing something of value. In casino gambling, you pay money for the opportunity to gamble. So if you lose, you've lost that money. If you play a lot, then you risk losing a lot. But every now and then, you win, and sometimes you can win big. So to say that these gambles are fair is to say that over the long run, you'll win as much money as you lose. So it comes out a wash. So let's look at the simplest example, a coin toss. Let's assume it costs a dollar to play. The question is, what should the payoff be to ensure that the bet is fair? Now this expression says that the expected value of the bet is equal to the probability of winning times the value of winning plus the probability of losing times the value of losing. Now here it's important to remember that you're paying one dollar for the chance to gamble. So the term on the right is actually fixed. You lose a dollar no matter what. The bet is fair when the expected value of the bet is zero. So we're basically setting the equation to zero. The probability of winning is 0.5. That's the probability of guessing right on a coin toss. The x term is the payout if we win. That's what we're trying to solve for. The value of losing is the dollar that we paid to play. That's a loss, so we treat that as a negative number, a loss of one dollar. The probability of losing this dollar is one, since we've already paid to play. And when you simplify the term on the right, it becomes clear what's going on. The dollar we paid is a sure loss, so we're subtracting that amount. We're looking for the payoff that would balance this loss in the long run. It's pretty obvious just by looking at this expression. If the payoff was $2 and we won half the time, then the expected value of winning is $1, and that balances the dollar that we paid to play. So this is a fair bet if the game pays out $2. If it paid out any less, you would be guaranteed to lose money in the long run. If it paid out any more, you'd be guaranteed to win money in the long run. We can run the same argument with a dice roll. Let's say I bet a dollar on a dice roll landing a six. What's the payoff that would make this bet fair? Here the only difference from the coin toss is the probability of winning. The chance of landing any particular roll is one in six. But the rest of the expression is the same since we're paying a dollar to play. You can see just by looking what the payoff should be. The game should pay out six dollars if you win. If you play six times, you're guaranteed to lose six dollars. But one time out of six, you'll gain the six dollars back, on average. 
and so in the long run you break even. These two examples illustrate a general principle. In a fair bet, the payout should be inversely proportional to the probability of winning. If I pay a dollar to play a lottery with 100 tickets, so the chance of winning is 1 in 100, the payout for winning should be $100. Now we're in a position to talk about betting in a real casino environment. One of the classic games is roulette. You set a ball spinning in one direction and the roulette wheel spinning in the opposite direction. And you bet on which slot the ball will land in. The numbers 1 through 36 have alternating red and black slots. So 18 are red and 18 are black. The chance of landing on any specific red or black number is 1 in 36. And if you pay a dollar to play, the casino pays out $36 if you win a bet on a specific red or black number. If you bet that the ball will land on, say, a red slot, it treats that like a coin toss, and you win $2. So all of this seems consistent with the casino treating this as a fair betting system. But now you have to ask, how does the casino make its money? If this was a genuinely fair betting system, then in the long run, the casino would pay out as much as it took in. It's hard to see how you'd make a profit this way. And indeed, if you take a second look, you can see that it's not a fair betting system. The roulette wheel on the screen has two additional numbers, a zero and a double zero, in green. So the number of possible outcomes of a spin is 38, not 36. This is for a standard American roulette wheel. Now if I pay a dollar to bet on a particular number, including either of the zeros, what would a fair payoff be? A fair payoff would be $38, right? Inversely proportional to the probability of winning. But this is not how the casino pays out. The casino pays out as if the zeros didn't exist, and we're just looking at a wheel with 36 numbers. The chance of landing on number 7 is not 1 in 36, it's slightly less than that, it's 1 in 38. This is how the casino weights all the payoffs for all the different combinations of numbers that you can bet on in roulette. So roulette is not a fair betting system. The overall effect of the disparity between a fair payout and the actual payout is that the house, the casino, will earn on average about five cents for every dollar spent on the game. In other words, the expected value of a bet is five cents in favor of the house. European roulette has only one zero, so the odds are slightly better, but the system works the same way. The expected value of a dollar spent on a roulette wheel with only one zero is just under three cents in favor of the house. The roulette is one example of a general principle. There is no such thing as a fair bet in a casino. Every game favors the house, either by manipulating the behavior of the chance setup or manipulating the payoffs or both. That's how casinos make their money. Not all games are the same, of course. Uh, a game like blackjack is different in that a skilled player can overcome at least part of the house advantage, but even blackjack will yield a predictable average return to the house. Also, there are some places where you can play casino games where the house edge is set to zero, sometimes as a novelty. But even at fair odds, you have to understand that the house has an advantage. Why? Because even at fair odds, the casino has a lot more money than you. What we're talking about here falls under a concept in probability theory known as the gambler's ruin. There are several different versions of it, but the one that we're interested in says this. A gambler with finite wealth playing a fair game will eventually go broke against an opponent with infinite wealth. This is a provable theorem in probability theory. To get a sense of how this works, imagine a game between two players. Each has a stack of pennies. One of the players tosses one of the coins. It doesn't matter who does it. A third party could do it. If I am player one and I toss a heads, then I take a penny from you. If I toss tails, then you take a penny from me. For every round, there's a 50-50 chance of adding a penny to your pile or losing a penny from your pile. The game is played until one player loses all of their coins. That's how the game ends. Now, if each player starts out with an equal number of coins, the chance that either player will win is equal. It's 50%. But what if player two started with more coins? Then it turns out the chances of winning are not equal. Player two has a higher chance of winning than player one and the chances become increasingly higher as the difference in their starting wealth increases. Just to give some numbers, if player one started with 100 pennies and player two started off with 10,000 pennies, the probability of player two winning this game is 99%. Or to put it in gambler's terms, the chances of player one going broke is 99%. Mathematically, in the limit as the number of coins that player two starts with approaches infinity, the probability of winning approaches one. Now, the amount of money that a casino has 
relative to the amount that the typical casino goer brings to bet with, is infinite for all practical purposes. So when you play fair odds against a casino and you keep betting, eventually you will go broke. And why does this happen? Well, it has to do with the fact that as you keep playing, any finite sequence of heads and tails is going to come up eventually, including a sequence of tails that corresponds to how much money you have left in your stock of coins. So it's just a matter of time before you lose. Okay, we've covered quite a bit of ground here, so I think it's time to sum up. The key concept I wanted to introduce is the notion of the expected value of an act, and use that to analyze the concept of a fair bet. We learned that casinos don't generally offer fair bets. There's always a house edge that favors the casino. This is the primary source of their revenue. But even if they did offer fair bets, they would still have an advantage over the typical gambler due to the huge disparity in the total amount of money that each has available to bet. This is known as the gambler's ruin. Now on the face of it, given the way the odds are stacked against the gambler, casino gambling seems like a textbook irrational behavior. But of course it's more complicated than that. People win every day in casinos, and some of them win big. And gambling is exciting. You can always think of your losses as the price you're willing to pay for an entertaining evening. But there's a darker side to gambling, as we all know. Gambling can be habit-forming, and for some it can be addictive and very damaging. In our last video, I want to look at the psychology of gambling, and talk about the role of the gambler's fallacy and other cognitive errors play in explaining our actual gambling behavior.